Sue, so there are a few authors who I think I have read everything they have published and you are one of them. And I feel like you have found a way to consistently tap into exactly what women are feeling and experiencing in a way that is astonishing to me. And here's a really broad question. How did you do that? <laughs> That's almost worse than the podcast producer who made you <laughs> count down back from 333. <laughs> oh, I don't even know how to answer that really, but... Um... How do we do anything? I don't know. Sometimes I look back on books I've written as I finish them and wonder who did that? Who was mm -hmm. that that did that? Because I can't take it in. But the fact that there are readers out there who feel they can identify with what I'm talking about and it kind of opens their heart or mind or whatever. Um, I mean, that's, that's a pure gift. And the only thing I can really guess about that is that when you truly write from the source, from that deep interior place in yourself, and you truly authentically follow your thread, and you go deep enough, sometimes you really hit a wealth of universal content and material. And um, I think we just want to open the hearts of other people. And if you can find a way to evoke that connection and emotion and help them identify with what you're doing, all the better. It feels to me like that thread or theme started when you wrote The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. Do you feel that? Do you, do you, do you look at your body of work ever and say there's, the, there's these themes that keep emerging and growing? Or again, is that something that people like me do when we look at all of your work and read all of your books and think about it? No, I, I think you're right that there are recurring themes in my work. And we, I think writers often go back to particular motifs that we're trying to either work something out or we're trying to, um, we're, we're unusually fascinated with that or something about it compels us. And it probably has a lot to do with our own history and, um, and just how our soul is wired. But I think the Dance of the Dissident Daughter was hands down the hardest book I ever wrote. It was the scariest book I ever wrote. I bet. Time. I mean, that came out in 1996 and I was out way, way out on a limb and people were rapidly sawing it off. I remember that. Um, but I think so much came out of that. It freed me, that book did, to go on and write my fiction. And the themes in my fiction really do emerge out of my own life story in that book in many ways because I write about gender and I write about race I write about finding our place of belonging in the world and um, just kind of being true to ourselves uh, but yeah I think I, re I'll, I remember when um, my editor for The Secret Life of Bees read The Dance of the Dissident Daughter for the first time mm -hmm. She had just gotten my manuscript and it, the bees had not come out. And she read Dissident Daughter and she called me up and she said, oh, I see where all that came from. And I hadn't really made that strong connection. So she was seeing things I couldn't really see at the time. But yeah, they're all they're all it's a web, I guess, in, that we're following. Some of my listeners asked do you still feel the same about the topic of the dance of the dissident daughter? One reader said, listener said, I just began my fifth reading of that beloved book. Wow. I don't think I've read it five times. <laughs> Good for her. Um, no, I, I feel very strongly about that book. That book lives in me and is present in me. And I am very grateful for the experience that I had with that. As difficult at the time as it was, um, it was an extraordinary process for me to go through. And I'm just glad I could write about it. And I was so scared to write about it because I didn't know how people were going to react. And, mm -hmm. and I felt very kind of alone in, in some ways and in other ways not. But um, the response to it was extremely controversial at the time and there was a lot of backlash but and, and was that, that be, taught me something 
And, and did, was the backlash specifically because you have been a Christian writer writing more within the Christian faith? Oh, I'm sure that was a big part of it. I had been um, writing from a Christian spirituality and art of life devotionals for guideposts and so mm -hmm. forth. But I think it's more complicated than that, really. You know, it was very threatening for people to have their vision challenged and their ways of being in the church challenged and how feminism and um, religion collided and what that means in my life and in theirs. I think it was very threatening and, and hard for some people. And I understand that when we get our whole for all of our interior furniture rearranged, we start <laughs> stumbling around, you know, but um, I think it's important to ask those questions. And I felt at the time that um, it was an, it was a question that had to be put out there, even though I didn't know anyone else who was putting it out there. But I learned that it's okay to be brave and say these things. I mean, what are they going to do? Internally, you feel like the witch burners are coming, <laughs> but, but they didn't, you know, and I was just fine. And I really learned a whole lot of, from that experience about courage and daring to speak my truth and being, you know, willing to kind of step up and do that. It feels to me in just this short bit of conversation that that is part of what allows you to go to that source that you referenced earlier, that somehow you keep making these moves to quote you that take your breath away. And where does that, does that come from I mean, you can't, I'm sure you can't answer me, where does that ability come from? But it feels like it's one of the core questions that we have to live in, especially for people who identify as women or marginalized populations to create. We have so much fear. I feel it in myself so often. And it's not, it doesn't take a particular form as in, I think the church is going to come after me or my beloved readers from guideposts are going to be angry at me or something like that. But that closing down <clears throat> what do you think has enabled you to keep walk because you've had to walk through that door I mean it may have started with the dance of the distant daughter but you kept doing it with every single book as far as I can see well I once um stenciled had some quotes stenciled on my wall and I took this so seriously I mean <laughs> I spent a ridiculous amount of time trying to decide what these quotes would be because they lined the stairway up to my study where I wrote and I could picture myself reading them as I went up which indeed I did and so I one of the quotes on there was writing is an act of courage and that's by Cynthia Ozick and I think it's an so many writers have expressed variations of that but I believe that wholeheartedly. In the end, writing is an act of courage. And it doesn't mean we don't have it. We don't, we aren't feeling intimidated. When I wrote the Book of Longings, I had some reservations like, what the heck am I doing? But I think ultimately, the need to follow our own truth, to expand our own soul, to be the writer we need to be, which is to be true to what is in us to say, and to tell our stories outweighs what other people are gonna think and react. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it really matter in the end? What matters is that this is our process and we have to be true to it and do the best we can with it. And we wanna serve our work, but we wanna serve our soul more, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you know when you're writing that you're serving your soul? I don't always. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fair enough. I mean, you know, it's a constant thing I, that we have to decide, are we serving our ego or are we serving our soul? Are we serving our work? Are we serving something larger than ourselves? These are questions that writers need to have somewhere in their heads as we're working, mm. or at least on the peripheries, or to ask them from time to time. And to me, just simply being willing to honestly ask those questions of ourselves keeps us on track. I mean, I can't deny that I have written things that serve my ego 
I, I'm sure that my motivations are not always very pure, but I keep trying to come back to that question and, um, and serve the thing in me that needs to be said, the deepest thing in myself that really honestly needs to be out there. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, you've said our salvation is in our imagination. That feels like related to serving our souls. Oh, the power of the imagination is um, extremely important. And I think culturally, not just as for writers as storytellers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but just culturally right now, we have to be able to imagine what has never been. And we can't move forward until we can imagine new things. It has to be imagined first. And this is one reason I wrote the, the book of longings, because I felt it was crucial that we can step out of these tight little conceptual cages where we live so often mm -hmm. and imagine bigger things that can cause us to see differently or think differently or but yeah it all starts with imagination really I love that again to go back to the thought that you have that at least once in our lives I hope many more times than once in my life we should take our own breath away and that when you had when you conceived of the book of longings which I love so much. I love how you wrote about her desire in that book. That to me is just a core theme in, in my own spiritual life and in my writing. How do we follow those desires? How do we pay attention to them? How do we honor them? What are we willing to do for them? What are we not willing to do for them? And I just, I can feel that in that book. I can feel how you follow that desire to, to write about something so shall we say, heretical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was a, a passion of my own to write, and then I gave it to my character. <laughs> she has a great passion, but, she, but there are terrific obstacles, you know, against. So as a writer, the thing, of course, is to identify what you deeply care about. And I feel like if we can write from the inside out, you know, rather than looking for a topic out there that might be we think in the news or um, might make a lot of money or that's an idea that's gonna grab headlines. I'm not sure that's the right way to begin. I, I think that gets into serving the long thing. And while that may work in some ways for people in the long run, I'm not sure it will be deeply satisfying or even transforming in the way we need it to be. Mm -hmm. So it, it's about being willing to really um, find that thing in ourselves that wants the deepest thing to be said. So it will emerge. It's like a little seed. And if we, and if we kind of um, have contemplative approach to it, it will emerge and make itself known. And, uh, you know, ideas are... <laughs> very hard to identify which one's going to stick around sometimes but I think we kind of know it and when an idea comes to me that takes my breath that kind of makes my hair on my arms stand up or the back of my neck or something about it makes you know you have the little flip in the stomach or the little oh, gasp like that um, or something just triggers in you um, I've described it as when you, it's like stepping on live wires and everything kind of vibrates. That's the effect they have on me, but then I have to let them, I have to play with them. And I really think that creativity is ultimately playing with what we love. Now that is what, I'm paraphrasing Carl Jung, mm -hmm. who is a great writing teacher for me. And he's, he identified creativity in that way of playing with what we love. So when you get an idea, often we, if you just play with it and let it see if it will take root in your imagination. And if it will, it will sprout, start to sprout a story. But you have to water that and nurture it and ask questions. It's usually the questions. You know, I'll ask myself um, things like, well, who is she and what does she want and why is she thinking that and what if she did this and and suddenly, you know, a, a, a really innate 
seed comes to fruition. Now, do you do those questions in a journal? Do you do them on a walk? Do you do them in the rain? Do you do them in the... <laughs> I'm yeah, thinking of the cat that, probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, I do keep little journals. They're not oh, very disciplined, I guess, but I do keep journals as I write um, a book about the process itself. And I try not to devote, you know, too much time to it, but I will note little things like that. And, um, but usually they are basic questions like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask, I have said many times, you only need to ask two questions to start a novel. I mean, you have to, that you say you have the seed of an idea. You ask yourself, well, who is this character? Because it usually for me starts with a character. Mm -hmm. And what does she want? If I know kind of basically who she is, even the fact, okay, she's a 14 year old girl in the rural South whose father is not uh, particularly a wonderful father and she has no mother that's all I knew about Lily in the secret life of bees and then I asked myself what does she want and I thought it needs to be something um, significant something driving forceful something that can sustain the kind of passion that um, you want that reader to feel for her about this so I thought well I think she wants her mother. That's what she wants. She wants her mother. When I knew those two things, um, who kind of the sketchiest idea of who she is and what she wanted, that's when I'm able to grow a story. You, years ago, wrote about writing The Secret Life of Bees and that you did a collage and you didn't even know what the images that you put on this collage were. They included a pink house, a trio of African-American women and a wailing wall. And I have to tell you in the writing retreats I've led for 20 years plus, I have people make collages based on how much that helped you. I always read the quote uh, about you discovering that. Um, do you still make collages? Did you make one for the Book of Longing? I did, I did. Um, it's um, just a real important part of my process. I've done one for every novel and I, I know a little bit about the idea when I start, but not much more than a beginning. And I just see what my conscious, uh, unconscious mind is gravitating to. And of course you keep, I, I keep lots of um, postcards and cards and tear things out of magazines. That's the old fashioned way. Now, of course, you can go on the internet and get all kinds of images that you would like to have, but it helps to just have a big bin or storehouse of images that have some kind of resonance for you or archetypal qualities, just a big array of them. And I like to sort through and play with them and, and just put them on a big poster board. And I guess you call that a storyboard. <laughs> I'm not sure. You tell me, Jennifer, what do you call that? I call it a collage. I call it you're letting well, your unconscious talk to you. <laughs> it feels very um, old school, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> but yeah, a collage. And so much can come out of that. All of my stories are sort of embedded in that. I remember reading something that John Irving wrote once, and I think it was in a Paris Review interview. And he said that every beginning of a novel uh, the whole opening is right there in the first few lines. Mm. The entire story is kind of like a seed embedded in it. And, you're, and, and I loved that. And I thought, well, that's what a collage really is. It's just a little nugget of the whole novel. And if you probe into it, you can find all kinds of things. Do you still actively study writing when you, as you did when you were a uh younger writer earlier in your fiction memoir career or is it more immersive and just part of your reading life now yeah well to be completely honest I suppose I don't do it with the kind of um determined attention I used to I mean mm -hmm. boy was I ever into it 
initially. I know. I loved on. reading some of your years ago interviews about how you taught yourself to write. It was very instructive <laughs> for me. Well, I really feel like I was a, an, an apprentice and I dove in with that attitude, I guess. I had, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I had to teach myself and but I also took classes. I went to writers conferences. I read everything I could. That was very immersive. Um, so I don't do that quite so much anymore. However, I really do feel like in many ways, I'm still a beginner. To be perfectly honest with you, every novel I write, I feel like I've never done it before. Do you feel this? Like Totally. Yeah. Like I've never written a word. I have no idea what writing is. <laughs> yes, I know. It, yeah, it's astonishing. I feel that too. And um, I remember being just overwhelmed every time with how am I going to do this? Do I know what I'm doing? Can I pull this off? And then just kind of stepping into it and feeling my way along as I go. But there is something to be said for keeping the beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, you know, Zen idea. But um, I think it was Suzuki who said that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. And in the expert's mind, there are few. Mm -hmm. So I try to stay as I'm working, particularly as a kind of beginner, so that it all is kind of fresh and I'm really reaching and, you know, struggling in a way to find the, the best book. One of the things I really appreciate about you and my encounters with you and, and in, in, in interviews I've watched and is that there's a, a deep sense of um, groundedness and, and for want of a better word, humbleness. Was that hard? to maintain when The Secret Life of Bees became such a huge deal? Was it hard to go back to write The Mermaid's Chair? The Mermaid's Chair was after Secret Life of Bees. Did I get that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Well, there were a lot of things hard about that. Yes. Um, the Mermaid Chair was difficult to write because I had felt like I had all these expectations mm -hmm. I had to live up to. And I did not expect the kind of success that the secret life of bees had that was a big shocker in my life I mean luckily I was in my early 50s when that happened because mm -hmm. um you know I lived long enough not to be totally confused by the all of that and yet at the same time I had a hard time taking it in and well let me back up maybe I didn't have a hard time taking it in I had a hard time owning it I was almost embarrassed by it. Did, that comes that up. It totally, it sense. totally does. I can't tell you how many women on the show have said some version of that. Celeste Headley had a TED talk, those super viral. And she was like, she just was like, no, that's not happening. <laughs> that's not, you know, and it really took her a while to go, oh, wow, this is opening up all of these amazing opportunities for me. For, for one example. So I think that's very common. Maybe it also happens for people who identify as men or, or more fluid gender as well. I don't know, but. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I had to work my way through that because it wasn't that I felt, oh, I don't deserve this. Or mm -hmm. it, it was that it was just so much that I, I didn't know if it would change how people responded to me. I didn't know quite how to own it and let it be okay or to sometimes I would not tell people things that were happening even if they asked me you know so I had to work that out which took a while and my friends helped me I think finally you realize that well this is your life now you might as well accept the success of it and the good things of it too this is crazy <laughs> and um and and be grateful for the opportunities you're getting and the things that are happening. But like you said, it did bring um, some interesting pressure <laughs> to write a second novel. Um, that that was um, the sophomore effort is a little hard sometimes to follow a good first book or, an, or at least a successful first book. Did you try anything in particular when you were working on The Mermaid's Chair? 
to overcome that or work with it? Or was it more just, uh, this may be hard some days and I'm just going to have to get through it? Because of course, some people never write their second book after their first success. <laughs> well, ultimately, I had to have a little talk with myself. I mean, there, were, <laughs> there were a few months where I was really stymied. You know, I, I was, I, you can get into a place in your head where the, the expectation you put on yourself, the perfectionism that you're striving for, it backfires. And it is, perfectionism is never really good for writing anyway. You need to just write your book without thinking about that so much. But I was overthinking everything, every word, every sentence. Oof. Is it good enough? And then the critic gets going in your head. And it, I got very stymied. There was probably two or three months there where I was not really able to write much of any use at all. And I had to have this conversation with myself about what was going on here. And I just decided that all of that stuff would have to stay outside my study where I wrote that it was not helping me. And what did it really matter anyway? Who was I writing this for? And it wasn't going to be the secret life of bees all over again. It was going to be its own thing. And it would be very, very different. I knew that. And I would just write the best I could and enjoy the process and be true to it. And it would be what it would be. And once I really accepted that, everything settled down. <laughs> I could just write. And I let go of all that crazy, you know, thinking. That's, a, I mean, it's really an astonishing tr tribute or example of how there's just this, again, this groundedness or this clarity about you. Because I just know, I mean, you make it sound easy. I know it wasn't. And for everybody who's been there as a creator, and it could easily come after a big disappointment, right? Or a big face flop, even maybe more easily. I don't know. It's so hard to put that stuff outside the room and go back to the work some days. And um, I just love the feeling that that story gave me of, how to do that it reminds me of Jung. He would had a something, some kind of thing that he made or found that represented the critic, and he would turn it to the wall when he was creating. Kind of reminds me of that. Put it outside the put the people and the who who hoopla outside the room. Yeah, it's important to um, close the door, you know, to all that. And I kind of I, at the time I would think about it as I would step into my study. It's like, okay, you're out here. Close the door. These little rituals help us somehow bring it home. They do. And that's one of the questions that listeners ask. What is your writing process like? Do you have any rituals? And we, we've obviously touched on some, like the walk up the stairs to your former study and the um, putting things outside the door. Is there anything that you engage in now that helps you write, especially when you're starting. That's one of the things that a lot of writers talk to me about. I can't start. I don't know how to start. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest. It starting is. is very hard for me too. I don't take comfort in that. There probably isn't a writer alive who has a hard, easy time starting, you know? So it's all about putting as Annie Lamont says, the butt in the chair, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting there. There is something to be said about the mystery of writing. You know, I, I used to lecture on writing, creativity, and soul, and I would talk about the mystery of writing, and then I would talk about the method of writing, and the mystery, we've been touching on it when we talk mm -hmm. about things like the source and the interior life and trying to have this conversation with something inside of ourselves, et cetera, and courage. And, but ultimately, the method is just as important. And I feel like a good book comes out of a really balancing an equilibrium between these two things, method and mystery, and all that that means for us. Mm -hmm. But method has to do with sitting in the chair and, and learning your craft and being an apprentice and writing that sentence over and over and over as you start. Mm -hmm. And 
I wrote um, until you feel like you can get into it. The first 30 pages are the hardest for me or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's a point somewhere around 30 to 40, 50 pages where those are the hardest pages I write in any book, especially a novel. And I write toward that. And then I feel almost like I'm changing gears Mm -hmm. and you're putting it in cruise control. It's not like it's easy cruising, but it's as if you've gone up the hill and now you can kind of just write. That's how it feels in my body anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's because um, beginning is so hard. And I'll tell you this little story. When I was writing The Secret Life of Bees, I was so stymied. Uh, about the whole thing how do I start where do what's how do I open this thing and I would sit and stare at the computer and I would get the tension builds up in you inside you know and I've had a lot of people say to me oh I must not be a writer because I can't sit there and think up things to put on the page I'm like no you sound like a writer to me <laughs> <laughs> always I makes know. me sad that I know because we think it should be easy Mm -hmm. or look like it looks in the movies. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And it's your own thing. And if you really want to write, if that's the impulse of your heart, if that passion or that fire or that need and urge is there, then okay, you're a writer. And the way to become a writer is just to write. That's all. And I was sit there trying to think of his first sentence. So I had this brilliant idea (laughs) and I would go to this bookstore and because I couldn't think of a first sentence and I would go down the shelves and I would open random books and I would read first sentences. Sounded like a good idea. I spent about three hours doing that one day. Finally, this staff person came over and said, can I help you? (laughs) And I stood there and I said to her, I do need help. <laughs> it's not with them. I need, I need some real help to go home and write a first sentence in a book. And I left and I went home and I said to myself, I'm just going to write any old thing. It doesn't have to be like those sentences in the books at the bookstore. I'm just going to write a book. And I wrote down what flashed in my head, which was um, that there was a girl lying on a bed while bees came out of the wall and flew around the room. It was a very basic sentence. Now it would later morph into a much better sentence, but it gave me a way to start. And I just wrote another sentence and another sentence. If you can make it to the first 30 pages, <laughs> good, mm-hmm. then you're, you're probably golden. And I love how that started with an image too. I think that is something wonderful about your writing it's so concrete and filled with images and sensory details that really bring the story alive I I ask you two questions at one time which is bad interviewing everybody sorry about that do you have any writing rituals (laughs) oh well you you know I probably skipped right over that no no I Um, I combined two questions (laughs) which is confusing (laughs) um I I suppose I do um they evolve over time. Um, I come into my study um, in the mornings and I, I write till lunch, but I usually start with tea nowadays. It's, much, it's a much easier process for me nowadays. It used to be a little more elaborate, but I'll, I'll just bring my tea upstairs. Um, I do st- have a moment where I have maybe five or 10 minutes where I just sit quietly with a journal and I let my, I try to clear, just kind of clear out. I think this sounds kind of rarefied, (laughs) but I, I kind of clear out my soul. In other words, I'm just letting things float up that need to be moved to the side so I can get to the, my story again. And there are things that are on your mind that distract you you know, so sometimes a little clearing meditation for about five or 10 minutes. Um, And then I just sit and I work my heart out. You know, I just work. When I'm actually writing a book, working on one, um, it's typically 
many hours a day. I've had to stop some of that long hours. I mean, I, when I wrote The Mermaid Chair, um, particularly The Invention of Wings, and, and I suppose even The Book of Longings, I was writing sometimes eight, eight and nine hours a day. Wow. Which is a little too much. You know, I'm not sure you're being really productive after about four or five hours. But I would rewrite and I would rewrite as I go along. But I have now reformed myself a little <laughs> bit and I'm doing better about um, giving myself time to not, you know, not be as driven about it. That's good. I'm glad for you. <laughs> so one of the questions I also got from listeners is that they are fascinated by how you do your research. Uh, your novels are based on history. Some of your novels are some of the best I've ever read. And as someone who's trying to write a historical novel, I get lost in the amount of research I need to do to make it authentic. I heard uh, Sue say once that she set a limit for the time that she would do the research. But my question is, did she only do research for a period of time, like six months, and then begin to write? How do you stay focused and not go down the rabbit hole that is information that does not serve the book? Oh, I'm not <laughs> sure I'm the one to ask. Um, when I was doing the Book of Longings research, that was the most um, intensive research I've ever had to do because I had so much to learn there and there is so much I needed to learn. And I did get lost in the research. Um, on at least two occasions, my daughter had to do an intervention. <laughs> so what did that look like? Well, it looked like this. <clears throat> I was, <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling this. I was researching the aqueducts in Galilee in the first century, the Roman aqueducts. Okay, that should take about five minutes. The second day I was still researching them. My daughter came in and said, are you still reading <laughs> and researching the aque Roman aqueducts? And I said, yes. And she said, mother this must stop you know you're in trouble when they use the mother word <laughs> mother <laughs> that's exactly right. the tone I get <laughs> and she was correct but I was you know I think research can be one thing is it could be so fascinating that you get lost in it and you just love what and it leads you from one thing to the other I mean really I don't think Roman aqueducts were that fascinating it could be an avoidance issue, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had pictures of them and everything, but we have to pull back sometimes and um, you need somebody to do an intervention sometimes. But mostly um, I want my historical novel to be so real, <laughs> so to feel so real for the reader that when she or he steps into that book, you feel like you're in a real world, this is really happening and it comes down to details, tidbits about a Roman aqueduct sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you have to get ahead, you know, go overboard with this, which I have done sometimes, but I create notebooks. <clears throat> So I'll have a notebook, I'll have like four or five big, huge ring notebooks where I collect articles, notes, pictures, all kinds of things, timelines. And, um, and, they, and I just re keep referring to them. So I did that for a long time before I even started writing, but it continues. But I love the research. You just have to be vigilant not to um, let it become a way to avoid the actual writing or something or just keep it in perspective. It's so true. You have to keep checking in with yourself. Um, so another listener said, while the heart waits is currently my roadmap on my midlife journey, I would, I'd love to ask Sue, what she would say now to her younger self. Well, that would take a lot of thought, and, but off the top of my head, um, I think I would say to my younger self not to be so angst ridden about it all, that it's all gonna work out. That, um, 
all will be well mm -hmm. and that there is as I wrote in the book of longings a place inside of us where we are inviolate and that really is in us and then we can find our way there we can make portals into this place and that is a safe harbor for us within ourselves and we and we'll be okay i mean at the time when i was younger um i often felt like you know things were so huge and there wasn't as much perspective there now with getting older and having a little more perspective and wisdom i can see that I didn't need to be that anxious about it or that conflicted, um, that it would, that there was in me a way, a resilience and an ability to be, to be in it and be okay when those things happened. Yeah. Your self-trust just grows so much through that experience. Yeah. That's exactly the advice I would give my younger self too. <laughs> Do you have a daily spiritual practice these days? You know, uh, recently I was asked to give a lecture on my spiritual and theological um, life in a way to, to, to reflect on it over the last 20 years. That's and not a small you, order. Can all. you like, imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have writer's block just thinking about that. <laughs> well, I thought when they proposed that idea to me, my first thought was, oh, wow, that's a lot. I don't even know where to start. But I said, uh, but I decided to take it on. I said I would do it because I was curious. Mm -hmm. So it took me quite a while to really reflect and think about this. But I learned a lot about myself as I reflected on that, about my path and kind of how I evolved. And I came to understand that, well, I think I already understood this, but I came to articulate it for myself that the spiritual path is largely about an expansion of our consciousness and an expansion of the heart and the, of the soul of just it's like growing larger somehow and being able to be more permeable and to take in more um, of who we are becoming that largeness inside and I saw the course of my life evolving through um, my roots, you know, in a very traditional Protestant Christian background to then a more contemplative spirituality, then branching out of Christianity into more ecumenical ways reading Buddhism, reading many other paths. And I saw myself incorporating feminism into my spiritual life, um, the work of C.G. Jung. And I, I could see this big arc of how I was finding my way by um, just trying to follow my own little evolution through life. Now, this place where I am now, um, it feels like, cause I'm in, I'm in my seventies now. It feels like I am trying to integrate all of this. Mm -hmm. There's no great urgency in me now to seek and um, explore as much as I used to. It's more about being where I am. Really being in my life integrating all these different parts of my life and all of my experiences and living where I am in a simple kind of simplicity of being. And if I had to say anything about what matters to me now, it is just about uh, the simplicity of being and being in my ordinary world and knowing the goodness of that and the importance of that, kind of a paying attention and finding compassion in my everyday life. That's kind of my religion. Yeah, beautiful. And I beautiful. skipped over the part about creativity, but I do think that <laughs> is a, an epoch in our 
evolution spiritually is when we understand that we are helping to co-create this world that that is part of what we're here to do you know is to put our voice and our little creative fingerprint on this world and that is a spiritual act I think and for me to write has always been to pray so you just you know now it's like I get up, I feel pretty content, and I'm just trying to be in each moment. That's about it. Thank you. That's beautiful. How do you transition between projects? Do you feel bereft when a project is finished? Do you do you show up and write every day, even when you're not working on a project, or do you kind of feel like, yay, I get to have some time when I'm not <laughs> writing? That has changed over time with me. Um, I have always taken pretty substantial breaks between projects. I'm not one of those miraculous writers who can turn out a book a year or something like that. Um, I, I guess it takes me from the inception of the idea to the finishing a manuscript. It's usually around three years. And then after that, I um, often take a year to just be and I read and I try to just be in the world and let the, the fertile, to let the land be fallow so that it can become fertile again kind of idea, mm -hmm. to use a farmer metaphor. <laughs> um, but it really is true in the creative life. I think you need some fallow time. I usually wait and a seed of an idea comes during that time. So I always have some time between, do I feel bereft or sad when a book is over? Often, yeah, I miss the characters. I was so um, almost depressed after The Secret Life of Bees was yeah. finished because I missed the characters so much. I, I loved hanging out with them and it had been three and a half years I'd been with them and in the pink house with them all. And so I had to, that was when I went out and bought a dog named Lily, which was the name of my character, which was comforting. It's my daughter's uh, name. Uh, well, I love that name. You know, yeah. I picked it because it actually in Hebrew means Susan or Sue. Oh. And I thought. Um, I didn't know that. It's a kind of, I felt a little bit of a connection to it, I guess, because of that. Mm hmm her given name is Lillian, but we call her Lily. Yeah, it's yeah. a great name. It's but a great I, name. I miss, I miss my characters sometimes, mm -hmm. but then I feel like they're all in me and they, you know, are living somewhere in the reader's minds or hearts. They're in the world somewhere. They are. They are so in my mind and my heart. So this is a question I'd love to end on. What do you want to learn next? Hmm. What a question. I mean, I suppose um, I want to learn how to write a book without any anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Would you teach me that? Sure, too? I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's impossible for me, but um, I was an interesting though, given everything you've just been saying, like, is that the next evolution to that kind of deep trust <laughs> in your imagination and your... I don't know. I may be talking facetiously here. I don't know. But I was thinking just the amount of tension and energy that does go into writing a book or mm. pulling off an idea. It's quite an endeavor mm -hmm. and requires a lot of wonderful hard work. I guess I have a fantasy about being able to breeze through it without any effort. <laughs> That's probably more of a magic wand thing than a real <laughs> evolution. Um, but, oh, I don't know, to be, to speak a little more seriously, maybe the next thing at my age is um, to really know what matters every day. I mean, life is precious to me now and it grows more precious as I get older because I understand that 
it's limited and I can feel that more intently now. So probably for me, um, it has to do with wringing out those things that matter the most to me and knowing that and really attending that. Um, I think about my legacy now. Um, I think about what matters having to be my family, my friends, my work, and really distilling my life down to those things and not these peripheral things or tributaries that take the energy away from what mm -hmm. really is important for me to accomplish and do or be now. Um, there's a line in The Invention of Wings where my character, Handful, says about Sarah, she says, she has distilled into a good, strong broth. Maybe that's what I want. So thank you. It was just everything I knew it would be. I really needed this conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. I love talking to you, Jennifer.